Okay, today we're going to continue chapter 11, talking about relations. Um, last time we talked about a relation being reflexive, symmetric, and transitive. And at the end I said that a special type of relation that has all three characteristics is called an equivalence relation. So on 11.2, we're going to look at equivalence relations. R on a set A is an equivalence relation if it is reflexive. and transitive. Okay. And recall the other day I talked about um, the relation equals. The way you usually when you think of equals a uh, lot oftentimes with, with a relation on the real numbers. And we saw that uh, the, rel the relation equals is uh, actually an equivalence relation on on it can be on real numbers or on on the integers. You just say it equals on on the reals um, is an example of an equivalence relation. Okay, so think about it. Um, any real number is equal to itself. If, if x equals y, then y equals x. So it's symmetric. If x equals y and y equals z, then x equals z. Okay, so an example of, an, of a, a special, you know, a very important equivalence relation. Okay. All right, so let's see here another example. If a is the set contain the numbers 1 and 2, then um, how big is A cross A? How many elements are in A cross A? Four. So, um, there's four, four ordered pairs in A cross A, so any subset of A cross A is, is a relation. Um, The relation 1, 1 and 2, 2 is an equivalence relation on A. Why? Well, it's, it's, it's definitely reflexive because 1, 1 and 2, 2 would both have to be in the set. So it's reflexive. And then it's kind of one of the first examples we saw, it's by default symmetric and transitive because you can't find, you can't find um, a point xy where yx is not in the, in the set. So it's symmetric. You know, 1, 1's in there, but if you switch the coordinates, 1, 1 is in there. 2, 2 is in there, and 2, 2 is in there. So, so it's symmetric. And it's also transitive because you cannot find a pair xy and yz such that xz is not in the set. So it's by default, all, has all three conditions. Okay. Another equivalence relation would be the whole set. Um, okay. So if you have the whole set, you're, you're basically not, you're not, not missing any any uh, elements, so you're going to have all the all the all the relations, uh, all these characteristics. It's reflexive. It's got one one and, and two two. It's symmetric. If you take any point and you refer, reverse the coordinates, that point's also in the set. And it's transitive. So, for example, one two and two one would would force one one to be in there, and it is. Uh, two one and one two would force two two to be in there, and it is. 
Okay, so those, those are the two equivalence relations. Remember, there's only, so, well, let's see. There are, are there any more equivalence relations? How many, how many subsets are there? If there's four elements in a set, then how many subsets are there? Two to the power of four. So there'd be 16 subsets. Um, but at minimum, they have to have these two points. Right? They have to have 1, 1, and 2, 2 in order to be reflexive. So this would be the smallest equivalence relation. If I added a third point, well, if I add this point without adding this point, it won't be symmetric. Right? So if I add one more point, I've got to add both of these points. So basically, that just kind of demonstrates these are the only two equivalence relations on, on any. So in other words, if you, have a, if you start out with a set with two, op, two elements, there's only going to be two equivalence relations on that set. All right, any questions about that? Okay, so I showed you some examples the other day about how to prove something is reflexive, symmetric, and transitive, especially when you have an infinite set. Okay, let's talk, let's do let's see another example. Uh, we have infinite, infinite relations here. relation on the integers. Okay. First let's show that it's reflexive. Okay. So to show that it's reflexive, I have to take any arbitrary integer x and show that the order pair x comma x is in this set. Okay? So I'm going to let, let x be an integer. Okay? I'll, I'll have shown it's reflexive if I can show that x comma x is in this set, is in this relation. Okay? That's my goal, to show that it's reflective. Okay? Any questions? All right. So let x be an integer. Well, in order to show this, I'm going to look at x squared plus x squared. Okay? So x squared plus x squared, is that even? Well, I can rewrite this as 2 times x squared. So it clearly is even. Okay, so x squared plus x squared is even, therefore uh, x comma x is in R. Okay. Because the relation R is a set of all points whose you square the x coordinate, square the first coordinate, square the second coordinate, and if you add together and get an even number, then it's in this relation. Okay? Good question. So to show something, a set of uh, show a relation is reflexive, you take an arbitrary element of your set, and then you have to show that x comma x is in the relation, or you know another way, x is related to x. So those mean the same thing. That x comma x is in R, or x is related to x. All right, let's do symmetric. All right, so for symmetric. Show that it's symmetric, 
I need to show that if x, y is in the set, and when I reverse the coordinates, y, x better be in, in R as well. Okay? So uh, I'm going to let x, y be an element of R. I need to show that y comma x is an R. All right. So what does it mean for x y to be an R? Then I know that x squared plus y squared is even. How would I show that y comma x is in R? What is the definition of that? What do I need to know? I need to show that y squared plus x squared is even. But these are these are real numbers, so we can we can commute these these uh, these terms. You know, so I would say, but uh, uh, that's it. But y squared plus x squared equals x squared plus y squared. Right? I mean, you add, you can add uh, real numbers in any order. So, what, so y squared plus x squared equals x squared plus y squared. Uh, so um, y squared plus x squared is even. I mean, you can you try to bust out, you know, the definition of even and, and set x squared plus y squared equal to a uh, two times an integer. And that'd be okay, and then you you just have an equation to work with, but you know, if, if x squared plus y squared is even, and y squared plus x squared equals x squared plus y squared, then this has to be even as well. Thus, yx is in R. Right, that's how you, uh, I, because y squared plus x squared is even, I can conclude that yx is in R, or, or y is related to x. So, I've shown that this relation is symmetric. Last time I need to show it transitive. Any questions? The last step? Okay, so transitive, you assume you have an xy in a point xy. So let xy be an R. And let yz be an R. Okay? Then I, I'll, what I need to show is that x z is an R. Okay. Okay. And that will show that it's transitive. And then we can conclude that R is a closed relation. Okay. Any questions <coughs> so far? All right. Well. What I know is that x squared plus y squared is even, and y squared plus z squared is even. Okay. Um, if I I need to show that x plus z squared. Yeah, yeah. It's if you if you start with x squared plus z squared. You, well, let's put it this way: if you add these two quantities together, you don't get you don't get x squared plus z squared. Um, but so so how are we going to do this? Um, in this case, I might um, maybe I should write these as as uh, like two times a and two times b, because I'm going to have kind of a more involved equation here. Okay? Yeah. I guess I don't want to do it yet. All right. So I know that x squared plus y squared is even, and y squared plus z squared is even. So let, let, let me just use the definition of even now. Okay. So then x squared plus y squared equals 2a, and 
r squared plus z squared equals 2b for some uh, <laughs> integer <laughs> a and b. Here's kind of the trick. What we need to do is show that x squared plus z squared is even. All right, that's our goal. We need to show that x is related to z here, x is in r. So I need to show that x squared plus z squared is even. Hmm, well, subtract what? What do you think? Yeah, because. You know, we have x squared plus y squared is even, so if I add a y squared, then I'll know that's even. If I add another y squared, I'll get a, a, a z squared plus y squared is even. But to take to counteract, I better subtract two y squares, and that's, that's an even quantity as well. So that's, that's the trick here. So, so there's my x squared plus y squared. And plus y squared plus z squared. Okay, so I have my x squared and my z squared, but I've added y squared twice. So I'm going to subtract 2y squared. See why I'm doing that? So convince yourself this equation, right? I have x squared plus z squared. I've added y squared plus y squared and then subtract 2y squared so that so it should, those cancel out. But here's why we do that. Because now I can write x squared plus y squared as 2a. I can write y squared plus z squared as 2b. And this is minus 2y squared. This looks even to me. Right? I can then, you know, factor out 2. This looks like 2 times a plus b minus y squared. Okay, so I'm convinced that x squared plus z squared is even. It looks like 2 times an integer. Okay, and x squared plus z squared is even. And xz is an element. So I've shown that, that R is reflexive, symmetric, and transitive. So if I had another line down below, I would, I would write, I'd, probably, I'd write this on you know, a new, new paragraph. I'd say, therefore, R is an equivalent relation. So when someone asks you to show that something's an equivalence relation, it's really like three little proofs. You have to show it's reflexive, symmetric, and transitive. Okay. Any questions? Sure. Could you do that as like x squared plus y squared plus z squared is even and then subtract y squared? Well, you don't know that x squared plus y squared plus z squared is even. What if, what if x is 1 and z was 1? And y was 1? That's odd. So, that's why if you, you, you we're actually adding two of these, you know, we're adding 2 times 1 squared. You'd be adding 2 times 1 squared and subtracting 2 times 1 squared. And that, this is, and this is, if I pull up in one for x, y, and z, so. so you'll see this trick more, more kind of proofs you see in number theory and the other stuff in the game, like calculus proofs, real analysis proofs. You do this trick all the time. If you, get, you want the quantity to look a certain way, you add and subtract the same amount. And then maybe this, you already know something about one quantity, so you, you can replace it. I say the first time you see it, it's a trick, and then the more time you see it, it's a method, it's like a tool to prove things. Okay.
Um, how about some uh, stuff for all of 11.2? Showing the sets are equivalent relations. Um, I'll just wait to assign some more work to that. For that. So let's go on to uh, 11.5 on uh, relations between sets. So far, we've, we've only talked about relations on a set. So the, the x coordinates and the, the first and second coordinates of every order pair are from the same set, A. Okay? But before, before we can talk about functions in general, we, can all, we need to first define a relation from one set to another set. So this is section 11.5, we're kind of skipping over a few sections. Uh, relations between sets So a, re a relation on a set A is a subset of A cross A. So a relation from A to B is a subset of A cross B. So you just kind of let the let you don't restrict the points to only using coordinates, using elements of one set. So that the, the first the first coordinates be from A, the second coordinates are from, from another set of B. Our relation R uh, from a set A to a set B is a subset <coughs> of A cross B. Okay. So the, the only difference is uh, the, all the order pairs, the first coordinates are in A, the second coordinates of every order pair is in B. Set A that contains point zero one two. B contains points uh, or numbers letters A B C D. Okay. So here's a relation from A to B. Relation, or this, look at this set of order pairs. All the first coordinates are in A, all the second coordinates are in B, so this is a subset of A cross B. So therefore, this is a relation from A to B. Okay. So, um, Especially with functions, oftentimes you kind of associate a graph with a function, and that's kind of the next object we're going to talk about are, are functions. So there's a lot of there's, you can graph relations. Um, I haven't really I haven't shown you any of the graphs that the, that the author uses for um, a relation on a set, <laughs> but uh, I, will, I will show you. You know how, how would you graph a relation from one set to another? Okay, so you what you do you have uh, kind of your set A, you, you have you know, element 1, 0, 1, 2, and you have your set B with elements A, B, C, D. So to show that two, uh, two uh, coordinates are, are related, you should use an arrow. So 0 is related to A, so I have an arrow going from 0 to A. One is related to C, and then one is also related to D, 
and then two is related to B. So you have these arrows. So that's how you would you might describe uh, this the graph of this relation, or or a, it's just a diagram, you know. And so I don't know with, with these small examples, especially like in homework, um, I would just stick to writing out the points. I mean, but you know you could. I think some of the directions in some of the homework problems will say like uh, write a write a relation, blah blah blah. You can give a, a diagram. But, so you can either do a diagram, but it's, I think it's easier to just write them as ordered pairs. But this kind of has the, this is kind of the precursor of, you know, this is the foundation, I guess, of, of for functions. Functions are re relations from one set to another set, and you have this, you know, these numbers, you're kind of inputs or plugging into the function, and they're matched up with some number over here in this other set B, and these are the kind of called the outputs of a function. Okay, um, this this relation is not a function. We'll see that in a second, in a few minutes. But a relation, uh, any function, this is this is a violation of the rules of a function. There's a point one C and a point one D. So one point in A is getting matched up with two different points and uh, elements of B. So, so that's, this is not a function for that reason. Okay, so for a function, each one of these coordinates would be matched up with exactly one element of, of B. Okay, um, so for chapter chapter eleven, this is pretty much all I want to do. You know, I did I did skip a few sections. I just want to get to the idea of what a relation is. It's uh, it's a way you know, uh, well any, any relation can be identified as a set. Okay. So when we talk about uh, functions, we'll, we'll just be talking about sets. And so th this idea of sets can be extended to much different types of functions that maybe in, in like other classes you might see. Okay. So that's that's if we if we have all of our sets, all of our functions defined as sets, there's no ambiguity about what we mean by the, by the functions. So this kind of lays the groundwork for for, for chapter 12. Uh, talking about functions. So we'll, uh, that might be a little low, but that's a good place to stop. We'll start, stop here and then start talking about chapter 12 in a few minutes. And I'll write some homework at the end too.
So let's continue with uh, chapter 12 on functions. I'm sure you've all used functions before in a class, right? So you've, you've seen the form state play and uh, algebra to even, even studying geometry or um, all kinds of fields of, of mathematics involved. Some kind of function, use of using functions. So, so you, you know, you're probably already convinced that functions are an important part of mathematics. So it's, today we'll, we'll define a function as a set, as a, as a special type of relation. Okay, but uh, if somebody asks you what a function is, what would you tell them? Other than don't don't tell them it's a it's a special type of relation. <laughs> I say, what's the relation? No. So, I mean, but what are your, what are your, what do you think of when you think of a function from your experiences? In um, one is the square and the half, or one half the square and the input. One output for every input. Okay, so you're inputting numbers and outputting uh, some uh, some number comes out. Right. That's kind of the way you know. In my in a calculus class, I had a professor who drew like a. Like a sausage grinder on on the board, he says, "Okay, it's like you put in the ingredients here at the top, and you crank it, and then out comes a number." That's that. You guys have that kind of idea too. Like you plug in a number, you get exactly one output number. How else would you describe? Anybody else have a different way you might describe a function? That's still kind of kind of a nebulous concept. Like we, I mean, that's you think somebody would be satisfied with that? And it, there's still, it's still, you kind of know what it is from, if I showed you something, you probably could determine if it's a function. It's kind of hard to describe it, right? Hmm. It's kind of hard to describe it, right? So, um, hopefully, you know, we can be very clear about what a function is now with, this, with the, our definitions that we're going to um, use today. Um, so, if I wrote this on the board, that would look pretty normal to you. Right? You might see this in a, like an algebra two class from high school, or algebra one class even, or, or from algebra to college algebra, or pre-calculus to calculus. Standard standard function, right? So you're probably used to this function notation. So we'll still use that function notation, but remember I said we're going to define functions as sets of ordered pairs. So this is just a really handy way. To, to, to generate all the points that are in this set. This isn't, I mean, looking at this, this is, doesn't look like set notation. It's not a set, you know, so just looking at this equation, it doesn't look like a set. But what are the, what's the set associated with this equation I just wrote? Okay, it's really, what, one way to think of it is, think of the graph of this function. You just remember what the graph looks like? Okay, it's a parabola. The graph of this function is the set. Um, well, I should say so. What x? I mean, uh, f is f is a function from the real number to the real number here. Uh, so that so 
this is a function from the real numbers to the real numbers. So x is a real number, those inputs are real numbers, the outputs are real numbers. Okay, so the graph of this function is a set of uh, all points uh, x comma x squared where x is a real number. So, that, so really, you can think of the, the graph of this thing, this thing you're used to seeing. The graph is the function. It's the set, the set of all the points that look like x comma f of x, or x comma x squared. Okay? Then those are those are the, those, all, every point that looks like that for any real number x, that whole set makes up the graph of this function, and that's what, really what we're going to define as the, this, as this function. Okay? So. Um, what does this look like? Right, it looks like this is kind of standard parabola. If you took you know, any point anywhere on the, on the curve, if you look at the two coordinates, the first coordinate is if the first coordinate is x, then the second coordinate would be x squared. All right, like uh, two comma four, for example, is, is one ordered pair that's on the graph of this function. All right, so um, the graph of f is a set of all ordered pairs, x down x squared, such that x is a real number. So this is a subset of the real plane, r cross r. Another way of saying, putting this is that this graph is a relation on the real numbers. So, so really, it's the graphs that you're used to seeing, the graphs of functions, that's the same notion that we're going to use to, when we define our functions. It's, set, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's still sets of, sets of ordered pairs, but they're going to be special types of uh, sets of ordered pairs. Um, so you, you have that, maybe have that ingrained in you, you remember those things like a vertical line test, where you're testing if a, if a graph is a graph of a function. Right. Uh, for, for a function, any vertical line uh, can intersect the graph at most one time. Okay? The idea is if no matter where you go, that, that one x coordinate will only, will only have one y coordinate, uh, second coordinate associated with it. Okay? That's the real vertical line test. So this relation is, is actually an example of a function. That's what we're going to define in a second. Yeah, here's the our, going to be our textbook definition for a function. Okay. Let A, let A and B be set. A function f from a to b denoted by f from a to b. Okay. So when you see this notation, what that we're doing this for a function from A to B. Okay. So first of all, it's going to be it's a relation from A to B. Okay. So it's a special it's a special type of relation from A to B. Okay. So first of all, a function f from A to B is a relation from A to B. What does that mean? Subset of A cross B. Okay. So you think of it a, a function, you think of it as a set of order pairs where the first coordinates are in A, the second coordinates are in B. 
Now, it's a, spe it's a special type of relation. There's a, there's a further condition. Okay, it's a relation from A to B such that for each element of capital A, so for each little a in A, the relation F contains exactly one ordered pair of the form A comma B. subset of A cross B is a relation maybe. But if you have this extra condition that for every element of A, for every little a in, in capital A, there's exactly one point where the first coordinate is little a. Okay? There can be exactly one. That doesn't mean fewer than one or at least one. It means exactly one. There's one point with giving any coordinate uh, in, in capital A, any element of capital A, I can find a point a comma something else, some other number. Okay. So in other words, exactly one ordered pair to its first coordinate. Think of uh, these all the first coordinates as your inputs, and all your second coordinates as your outputs for the you know for your function. And it's true. So for every for every input, there's exactly one output. For every a in capital A, there's exactly one b that's related to it. Um, notation. So. We're going to use that familiar function notation, then, like f of x equals x squared, those, those kind of notations. So instead of saying x, y is, is in the function, uh, so x, y is in the function f, it's written uh, f of x equals Still going to use, we're still going to use this notation. And it's, it's different from, uh, you know, maybe whereas before we might have done like, like if, if you had an element of a, of a relation, we said x is related to y. We're not going to do that with functions. We, got, we already have the function notation that we would use, so you don't put like x, f, y. Any questions about the definition? So if you think about it, the graphs of all the functions that you ever used in, in your math classes, the graphs are exactly these sets. You know, they're, those are all probably relations uh, from the real to the real. Okay. Or you might even say a function on, on R, a function on the real numbers. Okay. Some examples. Two sets, A and B. A 
Look at this set. Same of these points. Is this a function from A to B? Well, I used that, so it must be. No, so I mean, yeah, we use we use letters like little f and little g, little h. Those are the most common letters for for functions. But this is a function. from A to B. So we said, oh, it's, it, so is it, is it a subset of A cross B? Yes, every element in this set is an element of A cross B. Okay, so this is a subset of A cross B. Um, now, give me any element of A. Choose any element of A. Is there exactly one point with that, with that element as a first coordinate? Yes. If I chose one, there's exactly one point with first coordinate one. There's exactly one point with the first coordinate two. There's exactly one point with first coordinate three, and there's exactly one point with um, first coordinate four. Okay, so that's the other condition. Okay. Hmm. What if? To this set. Is this a function from A to B? Yes. Yes. So does it does it fit? Is this is this a subset of A cross B? It is a subset of A cross B. So it is a relation from A to B. Now, look at the second condition. For each element of A, I can find exactly one ordered pair where the first coordinate is that element. Is that true? Not for 4. For each element of A, so for, it would have to be for 4 as well. So choose 4. You know, 4 is an A. Is there exactly one point whose first coordinate is 4? No. So it's not a subset, it's not a function from A to B. It would be a function from the set 1, 2, 3 to, to B. But it's not a function from this set to B. Because you, you have to have exactly one point with each one of these numbers as first quarter. Okay? What about, so this would be, I'll call that R. Um, or not? Nope. Not. Why not? Because you have two points for one. Yeah, so two points, more than one, more than exactly one point has, has one as first quarter. This is not a function. So I want to just illustrate two reasons why uh, a set might not be a function. You know, because oftentimes we're kind of worried about whether or not, like, like this situation occurs. Is, is there uh, exact more than one point with the, first, the same first coordinate? So it's not, clearly not a function. But here, by by the letter of the law, by the technical definition, you'd have to have exactly one point for every every input. If you have exactly one point for every one of these input, uh, inputs. Okay. Um, these a couple other definitions. Um, let me just come back over here.
for a um, function f from a to b. That a is um, called the domain. Ranges, ranges coming up right after that, right? You, you, you use this, your, your uh, definition for functions to talk about uh, domain and range, okay? So if you think about it, right, all the points in this function have first coordinates in A. And that's probably how you, you, one way you associate with the domain. It's a set of all first coordinates of, of all the points in this function, okay? Um, so A is called the domain. B is not necessarily the range. B is what we call the codomain, okay? Uh, it said B is uh, the codomain of, of F. Hmm. So the codomain is really a uh, Think of it as those are candidates for the second coordinate at the very point. But you don't have to use all the all the second coordinate. You don't have to use every element of B as a second coordinate. Right? I mean, you could have like the first function I defined. The second coordinate was A for every single point. But I didn't use every element of B, so I still had a, I still had a function from A to B. Okay. So the codomain B, those are candidates for second coordinates of every point. Okay. Now. All the second coordinates that you actually see in your function, those make up the uh, the range. Okay. Okay. So the range of f is the set of uh, f of a such that a is in capital A. In other words. This is a set of all second coordinates, so it's all the points B such that AB is in your function. Okay. That's probably the way you think of range. It's the it's the all the, all the second coordinates of these points. You take all the points in your function and look at the set of all the second coordinates. That's that's makes up the range of a function. So, you know, when you look at a thing of a function that has a set of points, the domain is a set of all the first coordinates, the range is a set of all the second coordinates, the codomain is just, you know, the this, this second set, um, the range happens to be a subset of B. Right? B is like the candidate, these are all the possible uh, choices for the, for the second coordinate. Okay. Um, Go back real quick before I erase this over here. We only have one function here. So, um, look at this, this first example. So, what's the domain of this function? Domain of this function right here. It's the set containing one, two, three, and four. So that we already call that A. The domain of this function is A. What's the codomain? The codomain is uh, where the if it's a function if it's a function from A to B, we call B the codomain. Okay. But now let's more specifically let's talk about the range. Of that. So this would be the set containing all the second coordinates. So what does it look like? Right. Right. That's the only 
It's just the second hanging A. That's the range. Because every, every point has that at a set corner. Okay. Any questions? How would you graph this function? Let's see. You might, you might sketch a diagram of this function. You might draw it up one, two, three, four. B has elements A, B, and C. And then remember to show that for, for any relation, to show that two, two uh, elements are related, you have an error. So one is related to A, two is related to A. So specifically, if you, if you looked at a diagram like this for, for a function, for a, you can only do this really with, a, with these little finite functions, functions with finite number of points. But you would never see two arrows coming out of the same element of the, of the, of the domain. Okay, and I, had, I had a previous example earlier today where I had two arrows coming out of one point that fire this or what a function is. Okay. And doesn't that, you know, now, functions like this is, this is a, you might call this a constant function, because no matter what number you plug in, you're always getting the same output as A. So that's okay. You can, you can use this, you know, uh, you can repeat second coordinates, but you can't have any two points with the same first coordinate. Okay. Um, so just, get, again, getting used to you know, notation. What, what is, uh, if I said, if I gave you like a list of points, I probably won't give you a graph like this, but you could use this as well. If I, if I just give you a list of points and I said find f of one, that's how you would say that. Right? Find f of one. So what is f of one? So where would you be looking? It equals a, but where, where specifically would you find the information from this set right here? You look at yeah this. If if one comma a is in the function, then we call this the second coordinate f of one. Okay, so this is a very important concept. I think even going into your like your calculus classes and things, I always try to stress that at the end of class. You know, when you're looking at a function, every point that's on the graph of a function is you know the first coordinate and the second coordinate is the function's value at, at this function at this point. So the, you have know, one comma f of one, two comma f of two, three comma f of two, four comma f of two. Okay. So, so for this function, every no matter what the input is, you know, like f of two is a, f of three is a, f of four is a. Yeah. You know, so it's, you can still you can still use these. Uh, um, like equations to define our functions. Um, so I would say the equation for this function is f of x equals a. That's, that's like the equation for this function, where x is any element of, of, of uh, the, the domain. No matter what number you plug into the domain, the output is always a. Okay. So you still, you still use the same type of uh, equations, but the idea is this equation Generates points, and the points make up the make up the function. Any questions? Consider the functions, uh, and you know, I'm going to kind of use our our, uh, our kind of uh, understanding from like maybe like a calculus class or, or a pre calculus class. When I say a function, I'm, I'm going to give the, the equation of the function. All right. So consider the functions f of x 
equals x plus 2 times x minus 3 divided by x minus 3. And g of x equals x plus 2. Find on uh, the real numbers. Okay. So it's kind of way you have seen a function written in function notation. Okay. So you know you see this in like maybe uh, algebra classes or something when you're simplifying a rational expression, right? You look at this when you, if you had a rational expression like a, a ratio of, of polynomials here. You factor the numerator, and you see there's a common factor of x minus 3. <coughs> so maybe you're, you're already tempted to just kind of cross those out. Right? You want to just, you see a common, do, common for, uh, factor of numerator and denominator, I want to just cancel those out. And what do you get if you, if you just erase those two common factors? It would look exactly like this. Right? So you might think, so the question is, are these functions equal? What do you think? Are these functions equal? Yeah. So, remember how we said uh, we defined sets being equal? Sets are equal if they have exactly the same stuff in them, right? Well, think of these functions as sets. This function will define points, and um, you can plug in any real number for x in this point, in this equation, except for x equals 3. Because if you plug in x equals 3, you're going to be divided by 0. Okay. Over here, can I plug in 3 for x in this equation? Sure. If I plug in 3 here, g of 3 would be equal to 3 plus 2, which is 5. So this, if I, if I think of them as sets, this set, the, the, the set that this equation defines, has one more point in it than this one does. The point... 3 comma 5 would be in this function. 3 comma 5 is not in this function. So they can't be equal. Even though they're equal, they have every single other point is exactly the same as two sets. If one point is different, then the functions are not equal. Okay? No, they're not equal. Okay? Um, so f of 3 is undefined. while g of 3 equals 5. So, in other words, there is no, there is no point in this, this if you look at the, the graph of this function, there is no point with x coordinate equal to 3. There is no, there is a point with uh, uh, first coordinate 3 in this, in this set. You know what the graph of this looks like? g of x equals x plus 2. You should know, it's a, it's a linear function, right? This is a so if you have a, if the slope is one, the y coordinate or the y intercept is plus two, so it looks like like that. That's, that's the graph of, of g. What's the graph of f look like? <coughs> it's pretty much the same, except there's one, there's one point I have to take out, take off. Three, three comma five is on this point. So at three comma five, there'd be just a little hole in the graph. Okay, this is the graph of that. So if you look at that, I said this one has one more point than that one does, so they can't be equal as as functions. Okay, so this leads to our definition of how do we define two functions being equal? Now we think of them as being equal as sets. That have exactly the same domains, exactly the same codomains, and uh, the uh, f, you know, f of x equals g of x for every variable. So this is a this last definition. I don't want to do.
two functions. F from A to B. And G from C to D are equal. Same domain. B equals D, they have the same codomains. And F of X equals G of X. For all X and N. So, you know, if, uh, if, A equals, if A equals C, then they have the, you know, they have the same domain. Okay, so if you take any x in this in these two set in the set or the set, the the second coordinates are going to be the same. Okay, so again, you think of it as these two functions are equal if their sets of ordered pairs are exactly equal. Okay, uh, they are equal as as set. Okay, so when you see like f of x or g of x, those are the second coordinates of ordered pairs. So. First coordinates are the same, and the second coordinates are the same for every for every point. 